I'm Lily Madwip, and this is a nightmare. This is a nightmare. In fact, I'm pretty sure I've had this exact nightmare before. Me in a knife fight with Lisa Welch, surrounded by bloodthirsty onlookers cheering for my death. Although in my dream, we're usually on the school playground and I'm in my underwear. I'm going to cut you from taint to tongue. Lisa Welch hisses at me. I'm not entirely sure what that means. It's not her talking, though. That's Hecate. I know it. She's gotten inside Lisa Welch's brain somehow and is controlling her. Honestly, I'm impressed she had a brain to control. Lisa Welch couldn't find her butt with both hands. She paces around me, murder written on her face. Not really the word murder, like tattooed on her skin, but I could see it in her eyes that she's not worried she's going to barf at the sight of blood like she did back in second grade when we weren't enemies and we played together on the playground and I was skipping rope and tripped and skinned my knees. That time, Lisa saw the flappy bits hanging off my legs with all the blood and gravel and she upchucked right there in front of me. Like right in front of me. Like the barf splashed right on my legs. And if you thought I was crying from skinning my knees, well, I was. But I cried even more when Lisa Welch barfed on those skinned knees because that burned even worse than the original injury, which was still fresh, just like the mac and cheese she'd had for lunch. It was totally gross. I think that was the day Lisa stopped playing with me. Maybe she did it out of embarrassment. Like seeing me reminded her of that day, so she never wanted to see me again. And when she realized that she couldn't make that happen, she grew to despise me. I don't know. I'm not a psychologist. Are they going to start soon? Someone in the crowd says. I keep my eyes on Lisa. I can't let her stab me while I'm not looking. Can you stay out of this? The only knife fight I've ever actually witnessed was on TV, and it was between two rival gang leaders. I thought they were just going to go in stabbing. But instead, they held hands and circled each other while taking turns slashing each other until Michael Jackson broke it up, and they all danced to the power of friendship. I don't think that's going to happen here. No one wants to be defeated, I whisper. I hold my hand out to Lisa. She pauses from circling me like a vulture and stares at my offering with empty eyes. Hecate's done something to her, but maybe she remembers the Michael Jackson video, too. Her head twitches, and then she lashes out with her hand holding the dagger and slashes me on the palm. I can't help but squeal and jerk my hand back. Several people gasp. Someone claps, but then realizes nobody else is joining in and stops. Lisa looks me in the eyes with her dead ones and smirks at me. It's the same face I'm used to seeing when she and her jerk crew of friends circle me on the playground. I've always wanted to punch that face but I know I would just get in trouble for it and she'd get an expensive new dress from her daddy. The cut doesn't hurt at first, but then a deep slice opens up like a little toothless mouth in my hand and blood wells up from it. That's about the time... That's about the time the pain starts. I clench it shut. Some of the blood runs between my fingers. Lisa sees it start to run down my arm and blink several times. Is the blood snapping her out of her trance? I hold my hand up toward her. Maybe I can make her barf like in second grade. Look, Lisa, I'm bleeding. Her eyes go dead again. Yes, she says. That's how this works. I cut you and you bleed. Okay, no getting through to her, apparently. Lisa is a puppet with Hecate's hand firmly lodged up her butt, flapping her mouth, making her arms move. I've got to cut her strings. I guess it's a different type of puppet, but it was amusing me to think of Lisa like Hecate's hand puppet. <sighs> I glance over at Hecate. She's watching Lisa, not me. Or is she focused on Lisa because she's linked to her mind? Maybe I just have to distract Hecate to get Lisa... I wasn't watching Lisa. She moves in quick. Lips curl back in a snarl. She punches me in the stomach hard, making me double over. My ribs have always been kind of tender ever since I got a few broke last year in a car crash. This time there's a sharp stabbing pain and it burns right where she hit me. I swing at her with my butter knife, but she dances away, grinning like that cat from Alice in Wonderland. The crowd cheers. 
My Maxitar roars in anger. I hold up my hand to keep him from charging in and trampling Lisa. Lisa waves the dagger at me. Aren't you going to do something? She says in that annoying way. She says other stuff like, Oh, that's a really nice backpack. Did your mommy buy it for you? To which I once replied, Well, yeah, I didn't dig it out of the trash like you. <laughs> that was a good day. She comes at me again, her free hand balled up in a fist. I swing down and slap it with the flat of my butter knife. But it was a trick! Her other hand, the other one with the dagger, it's coming at me from the other side. It's only through luck and the fact that I threw her off with my slap that she doesn't drive it straight into my eye. Instead, I pull my head back and it opens my cheek. I can feel hot blood immediately running down the side of my face and I stumble back, holding my face. It hurts so much, tears sting my eyes. But I'm not going to make a sound. I'm not going to give her the satisfaction of hearing me scream. Lisa leans toward me and sticks her tongue out. Aw, what's the matter, Lily? You gonna cry? <laughs> Lisa Welch. Lisa stupid Welch. That annoying, perfect, punchable face. I feel all the years of her and her jerk friends harassing me that's been sitting in my guts, just stewing and waiting to pour out, start to bubble and rise up toward my throat. I want to vomit it all over her like she did with her mac and cheese to my legs back in second grade. I want to puke the mac and cheese of all my anger right in her stupid face! My whole body shakes. That's the rage I feel about to explode. I normally keep it in, but I can't. I just can't! Thinking my mom was dead, seeing Roger, being tossed in the void, Felix, snake butt. I look down. One of my tears falls off the tip of my nose and splashes on the ground to mix with the drops of my blood that have spattered on the floor. That's it! I grit my teeth. I need to end this. I need to stop this before one of us gets killed. Lisa has to go down. Get her out of the way, then deal with Hecate. I take one step back, take a breath, clear my head. Uh, this cut on my cheek feels really deep. No, 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 focus, focus. Lisa? Yes? I look up. I hate you! I charge her, throwing my butter knife ahead of me. Lisa smirks as it twirls past her, but I wasn't aiming for her. It spins towards Hecate, my true target. Hecate so focused on controlling Lisa that she doesn't even see it coming. The butter knife glints in the torchlight and falls apart and falls short about ten feet, clattering to the stone floor. I'm not really good at throwing things. That's why I play infield when they make us play kickball in PE. Infielders don't have to throw very far. Even then, I tend to just roll the ball rather than toss it because my aim isn't too good either. I'm one of the last pick for teams usually. I make sure that if I see where the ball is going to go before it goes there, I just move somewhere else so someone else gets it. Oh yeah, I was charging at Lisa Welch. Lisa's elbow comes up and catches me in the throat. My feet keep going forward. So do my legs. My upper body decides to stay with Lisa's arm, though, and gravity does the rest, sending me to the floor. There's a sharp crack as I feel my head connect with the stones and my vision goes blurry for a moment. The crowd makes a collective ooh as they watch me go down. Lisa's immediately on top of me, knees on my arms, pinning me to the ground. She grins down at me, dangling the dagger over my face. Maybe I'll make her wear your face. I can hear Hecate's voice inside her, coming out of her mouth. Then send her back to your world, wearing you like a suit. She doesn't have a future anyway. We both know that. Hey! Somebody shouts. Lisa looks up. Get off her! I recognize the voice. How could I not? It's my own. I tilt my head back. The entire room turns to look at the new girl who just walked in through the chamber. She looks exactly like me, right down to my tiger t-shirt, only fiercer. Her, not the tiger. She got all the anger written on her face that I feel in my heart. Just in time, oh no. Lisa blinks and her eyes go normal. Hecate must not be paying attention anymore. 
She grips the dagger handle firmly, which is good because the alternative was that she was just going to let go of it and it plunges into my face. She stares at the other me, who just walked in, and I can almost hear the gears in her head screeching to a halt. It's like one of those fancy salt shakers they have at restaurants that grinds the salt up. Wait, what? She says, looking back and forth between me in the doorway and the me she's currently sitting on. That's... Just a trick, Hecate says. You're not fooling me with your petty illusions, daughter. She waves her hand dismissively at my clone. Someone else steps out from behind Ono. A few people crane their necks to see who it is. I'm one of those neck craners. Everything's upside down from here on the floor. But I still recognize her black hair that she uses to cover the side of her face, where the fire burned her. Meredith! I shout. Meredith clutches her melted Barbie Nathaniel and looks at me pinned on the floor, with an expression of confusion on her face about on par with Lisa's. She's got on green jeans with overalls and a black long sleeve shirt, but she's wearing furry bunny slippers on her feet. I wonder what she was up to before she came here. Lily? She asks, then quickly looks at Ono disguised as me and squeezes Nathaniel tighter. She looks just like you. I don't understand. It's, it's a long, long story, story, Ono and I say in unison. Hecate remains unconcerned. And who is this child? She asks. The crowd of her followers start to murmur. That's Meredith, Lisa says casually, sniffling and wiping her nose with her dagger hand. If she weren't sitting on my arms, I'd have half a mind to reach up and help her stab herself in the face with it. But she isn't paying attention to me, and Hecate has lost control of her, it seems. And that's all I need. I jerk my arms out from under her knees, throwing her off balance. Then I reach up and shove her backward. Lisa topples over with a squeal. The dagger flies out of her hands and clatters across the stones by some random guy's sandal-clad feet. He stoops down and picks it up. The rest of the followers look at him. He just shrugs. In the meantime, I'm on my feet. Or rather, I've pulled myself out from under Lisa Welch, who is flat on her back with her feet in the air like some sort of possum. She's not saying anything, just looking rather stunned. While she sits there like a lump, I scurry over to Ono and Meredith, who look similarly baffled. I scramble to my feet. Meredith! I hug her. She tenses up, but doesn't resist. She feels warm. Maybe a little too warm. Meredith has a thing with fire. Like, she burns things, just by thinking about it. That's thanks to her melted Barbie, who's actually a totem for her angel, Nathaniel. I look at Ono. It's like looking in a mirror. You were just supposed to bring the doll. Well, she was with the doll, and she wasn't willing to give it up. Ono shrugs. I ended up telling her I needed her help to stop a bad person. Would you rather I return empty-handed? If one of us gets the totem of another, we borrow the powers with it. And when there's two or more of us, those powers get amplified. Like through a bullhorn. I didn't want to get Meredith mixed up in this, but I needed her doll so I could surprise Hecate with some fireworks. Time to improvise, I guess. Hold up! Meredith grabs my shoulders and moves me arm's length away from her. Can we talk about the part where there's two of you? What is going on here? Is this a new power? Ono and I look at each other. Ono nods, then takes a step back. One quick change coming up. You might want to look away, Meredith, I say. Ono is about to do her melting routine. It's very disturbing to see, and Meredith doesn't need any more nightmares about people melting, I imagine. Meredith covers her eyes. Ono starts to melt and reform into her normal self. What the F? Lisa Welch shouts. Oh, right, I almost forgot about Lisa. She's still sitting on the floor with her eyes bugging out of her head and her mouth hanging open. She starts making a gagging sound as she witnesses Ono transform, and then she covers her mouth and looks away. A moment later, she barfs through her fingers. <laughs> it's brown and it splashes on the stones, causing everyone near her to groan and step back, covering their own mouths as if the act of puking is contagious and they're all going to start doing it. 
At least I know she's no longer Hecate's control. And that she didn't eat mac and cheese recently. It takes me a moment to realize that Hecate is not standing behind Lisa. In fact, I don't see her at all. What did she do, run away? Oh, come on! I had this whole big bad showdown planned and of course the big bad you would have to run away again. This is just like last year when I tried to face Felix Weaselman and instead of letting me kick his butt, he threw his totem at me and fled. Ahem. Ono coughs. I turn back to her and Meredith. Ono has transformed back into her thin, scrawny, pale-looking self. She smiles at me. It's probably because she doesn't realize Hecate has somehow gotten behind us and is standing over her with a long metal spear. And Hecate is not smiling. Oh no! I scream. I try to move, but my legs are so heavy. So very, very heavy. I can see the murderous rage in Hecate's eyes. The same rage was in Lisa's eyes when Hecate was controlling her. Just a dead, purposeful anger and one thing to focus it on. Okay, okay, you can do anything, Lily. You can make and remake the world here. I hear it in my head. So I make a thing. I hold my hand up, my arm feeling as heavy as my legs. And make a shield. It's round and metal and shiny. So shiny, it's like a mirror. I see it in my head. So perfect, a hard, protective shield. Like they wear in movies with gladiators. And there it is, formed between Hecate and Ono, just as Hecate drives her spear down towards her adopted, stolen daughter. The spear meets the shield, and they slam into Ono's back, throwing her forward. For a moment, I think, I did it. I'm a hero. I saved somebody. But then the tip of the spear tears through the front of Ono's ragged shirt, already red and wet with her blood, and Ono looks as shocked and confused as I feel. My shield... It failed. Hecate grits her teeth and just keeps pushing, shoving more of the spear through the broken shield and through Ono's body. You ungrateful little wretch! She snarls. Do you think I didn't know you would betray me? There is nothing you can hide from me here. Ono is driven to the floor, retching up blood. She doesn't cry out or scream. Or maybe she does. I just can't hear it over my own scream. Meredith uncovers her eyes just in time to see Ono crumple over, blood spilling out underneath her. She opens her mouth in a scream as well. We're both screaming. I think Lisa is screaming too, because the whole chamber is filling with screams. Hecate thrusts her spear away from herself, letting Ono roll all over the floor, blood gushing out of her. I hurry to her side to get help, but Hecate's hand comes out of nowhere and slaps me aside like a rag doll. I fall to the floor beside Ono. She looks at me, reaching out a hand weakly. Her eyes are filled with sadness. There's blood coming out of her mouth and nose. Lily, she says softly. Her eyes look past me like she can't see me anymore. I twist my head and glare at Hecate. You evil bitch! You are going to die in a fire! I yell. My voice echoes through the chamber. Yes, yes, I'll pay the swear jar when I get home. Hecate starts to laugh. <laughs> oh, am I? Yes, Meredith says calmly as she wipes the tears from her eyes. Yes, you are. Heat comes off of Meredith so fast I see the air ripple like water in a pond when you've thrown a big rock in it. My dad used to take me to this pond in town and try to teach me how to skip stones, but I just didn't have the wrists for it. I always ended up trying to sploosh big rocks instead. He would help me dig up the biggest rocks we could find nearby, and then he'd let me toss them overhead into the water, and we'd cheer whenever one made a splash so big it got us wet. Fire isn't like water. Nobody cheers when fire pours over you. If you sat in the bathtub filled with fire, you might get clean, but not the sort of clean you really want. The fire Meredith makes comes up from the floor like a wave. I see it like the world has fallen into slow motion, rising up, curling over itself, slapping Hecate like a tsunami. That's a really big wave made by earthquakes. We learned about all the natural disasters in school, 
even though there's never any danger of a tsunami hitting us. Hecate and her clothes catch fire easily. Everything on a person burns pretty easily, I've learned, even people themselves. But it's not enough. Meredith clenches her fists, holding her melted Barbie tight, and the fire just keeps coming off her. The heat is so intense, I actually need to crawl back a bit because it's starting to make the stones too hot to be laying on. I try to grab Ono's arm and pull her away, but she's too heavy. Her skin is already blistering from it. Meredith? I yell. Stop! Meredith doesn't stop. Hecate gets smashed by another wall of fire. She's completely engulfed in it. All I can make out of her is a black silhouette. Or maybe that's her flesh. I don't know. She raises her arms and rain starts coming down from out of nowhere. Everybody else in the chamber starts yelling. I don't know why they weren't yelling already. Blood and fire don't phase you people, but a little water falling from the sky does? <laughs> okay. The rain hisses as it hits stones around us, the flames covering Hecate's sizzle. Meredith roars. She brings her hands up in front of her, palms up. Hecate literally erupts into a fireball, like Ono before her. She doesn't shriek or make a sound. She just crumples down, curling up into a ball of charredness that reminds me of Officer Flowers, the poor lady cop who Meredith murdered last year. Lisa Welch is still screaming. I think she's going to be checking into Happy Vale Sanitarium when this is over. There's no way she's going home unscathed. The rain turns into a thin drizzle and then stops. Hecate continues to burn, then smolders for a bit until she's just a black, unrecognizable lump. Ono's body lies red and blistered beside her. <laughs> I'm ready to cry now. This is not how it was supposed to happen. Ono was supposed to bring me Meredith's totem, and then I would set Hecate on fire. Meredith already has the guilt of killing Officer Flowers to suffer with. This was supposed to be my burden. Nobody in Hecate's group of followers seems the least bit bothered by what just happened. One of them nudges another and points at Lisa sitting in her pool of vomit, and they both chuckle. <laughs> It's not exactly the reaction I was expecting them to have from seeing their queen of countless eons dying at the hands of two little girls. Meredith drops to her knees, gasping for breath. The air around us immediately feels cooler, and I'm grateful. There's some red marks on my hands and knees from crawling on the hot stones, and they're probably going to turn into welts later. My Maxitar snorts and bangs his big axe on the floor. I think that's his way of showing his approval, but I'm not entirely familiar with the ins and outs of Maxitars. Hipsauce just looks bewildered. I imagine he'd like to go back home now. And then it occurs to me. I have no idea how to get home. Ono was supposed to lead me out once I dealt with Hecate, and, and she'd take over ruling the veil in her fake mother's place. But now Ono is dead. Hecate, too. And there's only one person left who can rule her place, and that's... Hecate's burned corpse stirs. It rustles a bit, some of the black ash and crackling bits of burnt cloth and skin crumpling off. And then it sits up. The small black lump atop the rest of it makes a horrible grinding sound as it rotates around. And then two burnt, crispy eyelids open and white eyes stare at us. A mouth appears beneath them. And she begins to speak. Did you really think that this would end me? Her voice sounds hoarse. Meredith and I give each other the side eye. That's the look you give someone when you're both experiencing the weirdest thing you've ever seen. Well, yes, I admit. Hecate's charred remains start gathering into a human shape. Or maybe she's just standing back up. It's really hard to tell when she's a big black charcoal. Little girl, I've been alive for thousands of years. I fought hundreds like you. Fire starters, ice makers, poison breathers, men who could rip you into pieces with a thought. Women who could burst your heart with a wail from their lips. You fought an ice maker? I ask. I imagine Hecate in mortal combat with my Uncle George's refrigerator. It had an ice maker that was always on the fritz. 
Hecate could pound her fist into that thing until another thousand years passed and she'd still never get any ice out of it. But I am the god of this realm, and reality here bends to my will. Hecate stiffens, then reaches up and brushes her face, wiping the appearance of burnt flesh and hair away like an eraser on a drawing. She runs her fingers back through her hair, and it's as if the last few minutes have never happened. Well, that's bullshit, Meredith quips. I look down at Ono's body, pathetic and small by Hecate's feet, feeling a momentary twinge of hope that she's going to stand up too and pull the spear out and laugh and say April Fools! But I don't think she knows what April Fools is, and she doesn't stand up. She just lays there, dead. What is the point of all this? I ask, sniffling. Hecate cocks her head. Hmm? Frustrated, I wave my arms at everything in the room. What's the point of bringing me here? You can rebuild yourself from death in seconds, but you get all pissy that a section of your big stupid maze got wrecked? And that wasn't even by me. That was some jerk angel who did that. But what does it matter? You can snap your own fingers and remake it. This was a test. Hecate stretches her arms over her head. Something inside of her pops. To see if you were the one to take my place here. I've been trying to find someone as gifted in the art of pure creation as me to take over. So I passed her stupid test, I mutter, clenching my fists. And now you just expect me to willingly stay here forever? Hecate clicks her tongue at me. You didn't pass, you idiot. You haven't created a thing. You got Anakoli to betray me, but I knew she would do it someday. And as for your little friend, well, you've only doomed her with you. The air starts to warm up. Meredith is going into defense mode. I created the butter knife, I point out. Hecate snorts. And the Maxotar. I point at my Maxotar. He hefts his axe and bellows loudly to show off. Hecate raises her eyebrows and shrugs slightly. Paltry conjurations. Things you've seen before. Do you even understand what is available here? Anything. Not just some half-man you read about in a book. What are you going to do to us? Meredith shouts. I notice her hands are glowing red. I can see the bones and veins in them. Oh, please don't go off again, Meredith. I'm right next to you. Hecate strokes her chin and looks Meredith up and down. You. I like your spirit. I look forward to breaking you. Then she turns to me. But you. You're useless. You were supposed to be the knife that cuts the veil. But you can't even save yourself. How many times do you have to rely on others to come to your rescue, hmm? Just once more comes a familiar voice from behind me. A man walks into the room. At least I think it's a man. He's wearing a shiny yellow suit like Doc Brown wore in Back to the Future, with black gloves and boots on. I can't see his face because it's covered in some sort of gray rubber mask with a canister hanging off of the front like a big metal nose and large dark goggles concealing his eyes. It's strapped on his face with only his ears and neatly cut white hair sticking out. A long braided tube winds down to a box at his side that's slung over his shoulder on a strap. You can't be here! Hecate yells. She starts to chant and waves her hands in some sort of spell-casting motion. Another being enters from behind the first, dressed exactly the same, but with a black suit instead of the yellow one. He raises a single finger. Be silent. Hecate's voice cuts out like someone pulled the wires on her microphone. She clutches her throat and for the first time ever, she looks panicked. She turns to her group of followers who have all taken several steps back from these new intruders. They all look at her with uncertainty, but she makes a gesture that I can only interpret as do something. And suddenly they start to yell and move forward. I notice Lisa Welch crawl out of their way. Two more beings enter behind the first two, one dressed in orange. He raises both hands out in front of him like he's clutching a pair of doorknobs. 
Take one step more and I will tear this entire place down and every one of you with it. He says through the mask. The other new being is in a shiny gold suit. He moves quickly, striding across the room toward the crowd of angry followers. But he's not going for them. He stoops next to Lisa Welch, pathetic Lisa Welch, and reaches out to her. She cringes away from him. My name is Jophiel, he says. I've come to take you home. Let me carry you. Lisa doesn't respond. I don't know, maybe she's too far gone. But the man kneels down and picks her up in his arms. As swiftly as he crossed the room before, he moves now for the door again, disappearing behind the other three. I look at the person in the yellow suit. I can't tell if he's looking at me or not, what with the dark goggles in his mask. I wish I could see his face and know if he was smiling down at me. Lily, he says softly, I'm sorry. <gasps> I run to him and hug him, not caring that his big plastic suit makes a sound like I'm hugging the tarp my father uses to carry leaves with when he rakes the yard in the fall. I want to cry. I also want him to pick me up like that other guy did for Lisa and carry me home. He pats my hair and hugs me back. Pasher. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching tonight's video. Or watching tonight, or listening to tonight's podcast, because it's also a podcast on Spotify, or on Apple, or on Google, or anywhere else you can listen to the podcast. On a hot summer day, there's nothing better than a glass of iced tea. And thus far, you should check out my wife's tea shop, etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. You can get numerous different types of tea, including a Mr. Creepypasta tea, the Dark and Stormy Night, which, if you ask, you can get the Mr. Creepypasta dabbing sticker on the front of it. And lastly, as always, I want to remind you guys, if you ever want to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta. And I really appreciate any time you guys can support the show, because, honestly, I love you guys. <laughs> You're all awesome, so. But a very special thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, ha ha sa ha. Ken Lenda Higuchi, Mazakine, Champinsky, The Red Oak Shield Virus, G Weevil 3, Diana Krause, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Tristan Pelton, Nico Cowell, The Ginger Bros, Last Blade Song, Caleb Dougal, Sky Harbor, The Homeless Bird 93, Bobby Karen, Liam Newman, Aaron Stormcrow, Barbara Maceo, Thomas Burgett, S Man, Kiri the Sloth, Bad Honey, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Shadow Morningstar, Mad Marshtomp, Mr. Thud, Patrick Schoolmeister, Z. Kearley, Wolfie Nums, Rafael Rodriguez, W.R. Axis, Prozac and Pancakes, Mike Bullock, Acid System, Lauren, Brian Ars, and Rumble Fox. And also a huge thank you to everybody who's down there in the description down below. You guys, as always, are the real MVPs, and I appreciate you more than I can possibly say. So thank you guys, thank you all for listening, and sweet dreams. <laughs>